let's go ahead and talk about what we've been talking about the past, oh, two or three services. We've been talking about church discipline, which is, uh, might sound a little strange or contradictory based upon what we're going to be talking about tonight again, but, you know, we kind of got off on this when on a Sunday night we talked about the old Methodist church and how they would, um, very interesting for some of those that may not have been there that night, but the old Methodist church back in the 19th century, back when there were circuit riders, they kept uh, very close tabs on all of their people. And the circuit rider, you know, would usually, they would set up their circuits and they would ride horseback and they'd usually take about a month to make it all the way around the circuit. They usually would have two pastors on each circuit, except there was a pastor there every two weeks. And uh, so what would happen was they had the ticket system. That's what I'm calling it. I don't think they called it that. But if you, uh, they would come and actually interview you and your family and your friends and if you uh, had been a good boy or a good girl, that's my words, for the past three months, this was done on a quarterly basis, if you had lived what they would consider a sanctified life for the past three months, you got a ticket. And this ticket would enable you to attend certain member-only meetings and services and so forth. And so um, the article was basically... Speaking of it from a very factual standpoint, the article did make one comment that this caused great stress to the members and to the leadership, this type of a system of accountability and discipline. And so um, from that, we kind of spun off onto how is discipline dealt with in the church? And it's, I think it's going to be a really good study for us. But how do we respond to sin in the church? Because uh, I, I talked a little bit Sunday about the fact that most denominations and churches err on one or two extremes. You've got the one extreme that it's kind of like anything goes and they never say anything and they never step in or they never uh, take any uh, control or authority. And so sin spreads and runs rampant. Well, that's one extreme and that's obviously wrong, right? According to the scriptures. But then you have the other extreme where you have the authoritarian approach where the leadership of the church is to be obeyed at all costs, um, no questions asked, and they start to dictate um, specific areas in people's lives and hearts that really should be left up to the lordship of Jesus, areas of personal preference, of discretion, and uh, they, they reach too far into your personal life and so they become very domineering and overbearing. And so you have the two extremes, those that do nothing and then those that do too much. And we, we're starting to see in the scriptures, the balance is always where? In the middle. And so, no, we cannot let sin stay in the church. Yet at the same time, we have to respect people's freedom in the Lord to make their own decisions. And that's, that's a touchy balance to come to. And so, but I think as we walk through this, it will be a, a big, big help to us. We said number one, and this is where I said before, it sounds a little bit strange, but the ground level number one stage of church discipline is encouragement. And that sounds a little odd, doesn't it? But this positive encouragement, you'll see there I put that it, it's preventive, it's positive, it's affirming, it's, it's gentle reinforcement. And we see it very clearly here in Hebrews 3, verse 13, where he says to exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so he makes it very clear there, what is the deterrent against being hardened through sin? What is our protection from the deceitfulness of sin? It's this positive reinforcement. It's this encouragement. And we talked a little bit uh, Sunday about the fact that, you know, the best way for you to stay in good health is not to depend upon medicine. The best way for you to stay in good health is to be fit and be healthy and be strong through proper nutrition and rest and exercise. You know, just like a, a good lawn you, uh, how do you keep weeds out of your lawn? Well, you don't want to depend upon chemical weed killers. You want to
to grow the grass real strong and the turf to get real thick, and that's what keeps the weeds out. So it, you defeat the negative by emphasizing the positive. And just like in our own personal spiritual life, how do you stay free from sin? Well, you, you don't do it with a whole long list of rules and disciplines and I'm going to beat up my flesh. And No, you concentrate on what? Walking in the Spirit. You concentrate on praying without ceasing. You concentrate on abiding in the vine. You concentrate on the positive, and that's what gives you the power over your flesh. And so the same thing here, by exhorting one another on a daily basis, we create a community where the momentum is pursuing godliness. And that's what keeps us all on track. And we're going to see no man, no woman can be an island to yourself. We've, the church is to be a refuge, a fortress, a hiding place for us to come in out of the cold, dark world and be refreshed and be strengthened. And so the church, the community, our relationships, not, not this building, but our relationships, the church community, is supposed to be a support network. We're supposed to be here for one another, defending one another, helping one another, praying for one another. All right, and then you go on to the next level where uh, of personal and confidential confrontation. I think we'll start that Sunday morning. So I'm not going to say really anything about that because I need to keep moving here. But it's, it, you know, when, when you have to go and restore someone who is overtaken in a fault, and that's between you and that person, it stays between you and that person. It doesn't go to the leadership. It doesn't go to the pastor. It doesn't go to your top 10 favorite friends. It stays between you and that person. And that is where, you know, really, this stage of personal confrontation is where most of the issues should be taken care of. When, when you have to have intervention by church authority, that's the last and final stage. That, that means things aren't going well. But most of the time, when you have brothers and sisters in the Lord who love one another and are seeking God's will, the, that this second stage takes care of 90% of it. It's only in the, what you would call extreme cases, where you have to tell the church. And it comes to that level, okay? So we'll talk about those three stages, but tonight we want to concentrate on encouragement. Just to get our, all, our thoughts all on the same page, we have the word encouragement, and then in the Bible you have the word exhortation. And these are sister words, okay? They go together. In the English dictionary, the word encouragement you, you see there, you have E-N, N, and then what? Courage. And so encouragement really means, the origin of, it means to put courage into someone. All right? So it means to spur on. It, it's to inspire with confidence, to give someone hope, to contribute to the growth and to the well-being. So this is this positive affirmation, this positive input that we are to give into each other's life. And then the sister Word to that in the Greek is the word exhort, parakaleo, like paraklesis or the paraclete, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Para means by the side of, kaleo means to call or to invite. And so in the Greek, it is a very affectionate term. As you see there in some of the meanings, it means to appeal, to beg, to beseech, to implore, to plead means to comfort, to encourage. You're calling someone to your side to help them, to be with them, to take them through. And so this is what our ministry is to one another, and this should be really the culture of the church. All right? You don't come to church to get beat up. We get beat up enough in the world. You don't, get, uh, you don't come to church to be criticized or condemned. The devil does that all on his own. He's the accuser of the brethren. When you leave church, if you don't leave lighter, if you don't leave uh, being relieved of your burdens and of your guilt, if you don't leave feeling stronger and inspired to live for God, something is wrong. Okay? So this is the culture and this is the environment of the church. I put this in there. This came out, uh, what was that, yesterday? This was a devotional from Chuck Swindell. This is interesting. Are you guys ready for this? Look at what he says. Anna Schuyler, 
the author of a book called Runaway Wives, that kind of leaves a lot for the imagination, doesn't it, was a guest on a local talk show. In the course of the discussion, she cited that, now this is what you need to get, 10 years ago, for every wife or mother who walked away from her home and responsibilities, 600 husbands and fathers walked out. So you get that? So the ratio there is 10 years ago, the ratio was 1 to 600. Today, for each man who walks away, what does it say? What has happened, ladies? I guess you all decided I'm through, I've had enough with you guys, right? But something really reversed in the past 10 years, didn't it? Contrary to our great American heritage, many of today's citizens would rather quit than stick. That which was once not even an option is now standard operating procedure. Every achievement, this is a great paragraph, every achievement worth remembering is stained with the blood of diligence and scarred by the wounds of disappointment. Anybody here have some of those wounds? To quit, to run, to escape, to hide, none of these options solve anything. They only postpone the acceptance of and the reckoning with reality. Churchill put it well. He had some great sayings back in World War II. Wars are not won by evacuations. Isn't that true? Battles are won in the trenches, in the grit and grime of courageous determination, in the arena of life, day in and day out, amidst the smell of sweat and the cry of anguish. Giving thoughts to giving up, Consider, considering the possibility of quitting, looking for an easy way out, don't. And in that last paragraph, every journey is accomplished one step at a time. Don't stop now. And I think when we talk about encouragement, this ministry of encouragement is really summed up so well here in this article by Chuck Swindoll. This we are coming together to strengthen one another to say you can't give up. There's no easy way out. Giving up solves nothing. All right, so let's go through. Now, you know, you see there, I think there's eight pages of notes, and I told you on Sunday, there's, we won't cover even half of that, okay? But I wanted to give you all of those scriptures, which is kind of what you don't want to do when you teach, a teaching is supposed to be like a bullet. It's not supposed to be a shotgun. And what you have in your hands is more like a shotgun. But uh, I wanted you to see all of the volume of scriptures, and that's not even touching the surface, all of the volumes of scriptures about encouragement and how much the Bible talks about it and how necessary it is. Encouragement within a godly community is vital for every Christian. We're going to find out. Those people that think that they can live without community more than likely, I, I'm not going to say every time, but more than likely they're going to fall and fall away because they don't have the support and the strength that they need from brothers and sisters around them. But encouragement provides reminders and instruction. How many times, like even on a Sunday night here, have you listened to someone talk about their life or give a testimony and you learn a lot from them, don't you? I mean, listening to someone who's been through something and how they got through it, you know, that one night when Cheryl was talking about, you know, what, uh, what it was like going through her surgeries and almost dying, and uh, there was some great inspiration in that. And, and you begin to listen and you begin to learn, wow, that's how she made it through. I bet you that will work for me too. And so you, you're reminded of things in the scripture and about God and you're reminded about why we're serving God and we're, we're reminded about why sin is so bad. And, and then there's inspiration and vision, you know? Your brothers and sisters just inspire you in some way. You, you hear how they love God or you hear how they read His Word or you, you hear how they pray throughout the day and it just inspires you to do likewise. Hope and faith. You know, hope and faith is contagious. And you get around brothers and sisters that are full of the hope and faith of God. And it's just, it just some kind, kind of just transfers through osmosis. And it gets you excited. Comfort and consolation. 
How many of you at times have needed a really good shoulder to cry on? And after you cried on that shoulder and talked things out, guess what happens? You find the will and the strength to go another day. Before you were able to cry on that shoulder, you, you didn't have the strength. You didn't have the will to try again. But just by having a friend to listen and to hold you and to pray with you and to speak to you, you found the will to go at it again and to not give up. Fortification and refuge. We need a refuge from this world system. We need a refuge from the Pharisees in the land. We need a place where we can come and be encouraged and find peace. And that's what the church is all about. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is what? Alone. All of us, you know, we're so thankful. We have spouses that are serving the Lord. And yes, they will be our confidant, our best friend, the one that we always turn to first. But as we, uh, I think it was Sunday we mentioned, you know, you, you need some girls, you need some girlfriends. And guys, you need some guy friends. There's, there's times when a girl just needs to talk to another girl. And a guy needs to talk to another guy. And there's things that you all talk about that's a little easier with the same sex. You know, sometimes your uh, spouse doesn't really get it. And so the relationships, yes, uh, the marriage is first, but it's got to extend beyond that into the body of Christ. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can they be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, with two, you can do what? You can withstand him. And so, I mean, what about those times where you could end up dying and giving up if you don't have those relationships in place? This fellowship in the Scriptures, it's just as important as your personal prayer life, as your personal devotion or study life, this is one ingredient in the weaponry that you have to live successfully as a Christian. Encouragement is the infusion of hope and courage and faith and life and inspiration. I want you to see that biblical encouragement is not a hallmark feel-good moment. Okay, We're not talking about you know, the goosebumps you get after you read a poem. We're talking about Life and energy actually being transferred into your heart. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Meaning this, be open to one another. Warmly receive and welcome one another. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of what? The manifold grace of God. Now this verse 10, I don't want to take too much time in breaking it down, but what it's saying is, as you minister to your brothers and sisters, the grace of God flows from you to them. It's tangible. It's tangible. And you can change a life. You know, just a, a simple example of this, this last time that I went to see Ruth, I think it was last Friday after work. Was it last Friday? Uh, yeah, it was. I went to see her. and So I was sitting there with her and Edwin, and we were just talking casually back and forth. And Ruth, if, if, when you go to see her, if you go to see her, or even if you talk to her on the phone, she has very emotional moments where... One moment she's talking fine, and then the next moment she's sobbing. And I think some of that is her, and then I think some of it is also the stroke. You know, anytime you receive an injury to the brain, it can make you more emotional than usual. And so, um, and so she was talking, and the, and the visit before then, Terry was with me. And so we were talking, and she said, uh, you know what Terry said to me the last time I've never forgotten? And the last time we were there, she had one of those moments where she broke into tears and she was crying and she said, I've been asking God, why didn't you just let me die? Why did you leave me alive like this? And uh, Terry, without even hesitating, said, because your children need you. 
your children still need you. And she said, I've never forgotten that. She said, I think about that every day. And she said, now, when I pray, I don't ask God why anymore, but I just ask God to make me better so that I can take care of my children again. Now see, I think both Terry and I went away that day. We never even gave that a second thought. But just one little phrase, and you can turn someone's heart. One little phrase, and the grace of God can be infused into their heart, and they can have reason to live again. It's amazing how this works. It's amazing how important this is, especially in our day and age. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So as we minister one to another, never think that it's just a human friendship or, or it's something in common through a church association. Realize that is the grace of God being transferred from member to member, and that is how the body grows. Encouragement is the standard and very essence of church community. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 through 32, this is the standard of how we are to function as a church. You ready for this? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. None. What is corrupt communication? The verse goes on to define it. But that which is good to the use of what? Edifying. If what you're about to say does not edify and build someone up, don't say it. It's corrupt. That it may minister what? Grace unto the hearers. If we could just train ourselves to think before we speak, to put that scriptural biblical filter over our mouth and think, what is the effect of these words? And would I want these words being spoken to me in this way? Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is wanting to use your mouth for edification, to build someone up, to encourage them, and you're letting your mouth being used to be used for just the opposite. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, put it away from you. That's corrupt communication. But instead, be ye what? Kind. And remember what kindness is in the Bible. Kindness is goodness in action. Your words are to be good words. Your words are to bring good to someone. What's the next phrase? Tender-hearted. You know what tender-hearted is? Even for us guys, you know, macho guys, tender-hearted means you're sensitive. You're sensitive to someone else's heart and feelings and thoughts. And before you speak, you think, how is this going to sound to them? What is this going to communicate to them? Is there any way I might offend them or hurt them? You're tender-hearted. Your heart is tender. It's sensitive. It, it hurts at, at just the very thought of causing any offense to someone else. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So this is the rule of thumb for the church. No corrupt communication. Only that which is good for the use of edifying. And you know, the closer we come to one another, the more familiar we are with one another. Sometimes our lips get a little loose. You know, and we can say things that do hurt and offend uh, the closer we become and the more comfortable we become with each other, that's great, we want it that way, but we have to be even more careful with our words. Encouragement is just as much the delivery as it is the context. It's just as much nonverbal as it is verbal. And I put there, I think, three scriptures, and let me just pull out a phrase from each of them. Ephesians 4, verse 15 says what? Speaking the truth, in love. Now most people interpret this, well I shouldn't say most, that's a bad generalization. Some people <clears throat> interpret this incorrectly. Some people think this means, well I just, I just spoke my mind, I was loving them. No, that's not loving them. I was just being honest, that's not loving them. That kind of love you can rip people to shreds. 
and separate them. Speaking the truth is speaking the Word of God, speaking the principles of the Word of God, speaking things which edify, speaking things that are in agreement with the Word of God. And how do you say it? You say it in love. And again, like I said before, you know, I, I think through the years we've had a lot of different segments of the body of Christ try to redefine love. Love is defined by 1 Corinthians 13. Nothing more, nothing less. So if your words are not said in patience, in gentleness, in kindness, you're not talking in love. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things. Because that's how you transfer the life of God. That's how you transfer the kindness of God. Think about your Heavenly Father and moments when your Heavenly Father has spoken to you. Has He ever come and beat you up and thrown you down on the ground, chewed you up, spit you out? But how many of you have had a so-called Christian do that to you? All you have to do is think about how does God speak with me? How does He deal with me? And that's how I need to deal with others. Speaking the truth in love. And then, this one. <laughs> if you see a brother or see a man overtaken in a fault, restore such a one in the spirit of... What? But see, we see, we think if we see someone overtaken in a fault, we call down fire, hell, and brimstone and, you know, beat them up and pound them into the ground and make them feel less than a worm. And it's supposed to be done how? In the spirit of... Meekness, and if you start to go through these type of scriptures in the New Testament, you'll see that Paul always talks about how you do it just as much as he talks about what you do. What do you do? You restore them. But how do you do it? In the spirit of meekness. And remember, probably the best translation for meekness in the New Testament is gentleness. So even someone that's overtaken in a fault receives gentleness. And you know what? Sunday morning, I'm going to tell you why. There's a reason why, and I'll tell you Sunday. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at this. L look at verse 25 first. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay, so this, you're correcting people here, right? But watch how you are to correct. The servant of the Lord must not, what? Strive. What he's saying is, don't get in an argument. Don't start debating. This is not about who can win the discussion, who can quote more scripture, who can prove they're right. It, it, you're not striving. You simply speak the truth. You are gentle unto who? All men. Not just to those who agree with you, but you're gentle unto all men, apt to teach. What's the next word? Patient. You're not abrupt. You're not abrasive. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So how do you instruct those that oppose themselves? In, you see, there's, there's, a, there's just this culture, there's this environment that's supposed to permeate the church the community of God. And so it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. And you all know that scripture where Jesus said if you put a stumbling block in front of your brothers or in front of your sister, you, you need a millstone hung around your neck. I think that really applies to people in that these verses are addressing because you know, someone can receive the, someone can speak the truth, but they say it so harshly, so critically, so condemningly, so, um, so condescendingly that you can't receive it. And so they're throwing a stumbling block in front of you, and you can't receive the truth of what they're saying because of how they're saying it. That's a stumbling block. You're hindering someone from the truth. And it's better for a millstone to be hung around your neck. There's a way that we do it. Encouragement is just as much about the delivery as it is about the context. So we're never condescending. 
There's never any self-righteousness or pride or criticism or harshness. We speak the truth, and we let the truth be the authority. But we're gentle. You know, we come back to that thing of, of hate the sin and love the sinner. We'll probably talk about that a little bit on Sunday too. That's, that's real. That's Bible. Encouragement is taking the offensive against sin by, by providing a positive momentum for holiness. All right? I want to move on quickly here. So in this environment of encouraging one another in the Word of God and in the principles of serving God, we're creating positive reinforcement, positive momentum. You go out in the world, and the momentum out in the world is what? Everything towards sin and temptation and lust and pride and selfishness. And you come into the church, and you, you, you should walk into an oasis where everything is pushing you. There's a momentum towards God and godliness. I, had to, I couldn't resist this. I had to put this in. Have you all... You, some of you are laughing. You all have heard about the Ashley Madison website and all of the... Do you realize that in this nation there are only three zip codes without an Ashley Madison user? Can you believe it? Look at these zip codes. If you live in Polvadera, New Mexico, or in Nicolai or Perryville, Alaska, you don't have any neighbors who are registered with Ashley Madison. However, Polavadera, population of 269 people, has no internet access. Nicolai has a population of 94 people, and Perryville has a population of 113. That's 476 people out of more than 321 million Americans. The rest of us are left to wonder about our neighbors' marriages. Isn't that sad? But, I, you know, this was a statistic that was, it was just perfect to describe the onslaught and the dominance of sin in our culture, in our nation. And the fact of the matter is, you will not stand against the momentum of evil by yourself. You better have a church community where there's positive reinforcement, where there's edification, where there's encouragement, where there's positive momentum towards godliness. Because you can't survive this tide and this current on your own. Okay? I just thought that was an interesting example. Encouragement is taking the offensive against sin here in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20. This is a great passage. It says in verse 21, the inhabitants of one city shall go to the other, saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts, and I will go also. And that needs to be our heart and our attitude. What's coming out of our heart and coming off of our lips should be, hey, let's go pray. Let's go seek the Lord. I'll go with you, is what he's saying here in verse 21. That's the positive reinforcement that we are to have in one another's lives. And look at the result, verse 22. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord. If we can just get that positive momentum started. Oh boy, there's so much good stuff, but I'm, I'm not going to go through it. You can, you can look at these verses on your own. It's interesting. Here, I'll just point a couple things out. Here in Colossians and then in Ephesians. All right, so these are two different churches. One church in Ephesus, one church in Colossae. And look at what, he, what Paul is doing here. He says, uh, he says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, whom I, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. That's the encouragement. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. All right, this is to the church of Colossae. Watch what happens to the church at Ephesus but that you may also know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother, shall make known to you all things. So what's happening here? Do you see how Paul was very careful to establish channels of communication between the believers? To make sure that nobody was isolated or left out, but to make sure communication and edification and the testimonies were flowing back and forth so that everybody could be encouraged and everybody could be comforted. 
because the saints in Colossae needed to know that the saints in Ephesus were doing strong, doing good, seeking the Lord, and that inspired them. Yeah, we can do it too. We, you know, our brothers in Colossae are standing strong. We need to stand strong too. And there was that mutual edification and encouragement. And Paul was very careful to make sure that that happened. Sunday morning, we talked about the relationships that are built from encouragement. And we saw in 1 Samuel 23 how that, uh, that Jonathan went to David when David was in the wilderness being chased by Saul. And it says that he went to David and strengthened his hand in God. And that's what we need to do. We need to strengthen each other's hand in God. And as a result, they made a covenant with each other before the Lord. And we talked about the bond that comes when you go through hard times with someone and you cry with them when they're crying and you bleed with them when they bleed and when you lift up their hands when they're hurting and don't have any strength of their own. There's a, there's a great covenant, there's a great bond, a relationship that starts to be established between the two of you. And it's healthy. And it's affirming, and we need to build those relationships. Last, I wanted you to see here in the, uh, Isaiah chapter 35. I think it's uh, like page 4, maybe top of page 5 in your notes. Isaiah 35, I want you to see that this encouragement is something that the Lord commands. Verse 3, strengthen ye the weak hands. Confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. But that's to be our ministry. And that was really the ministry of Jesus, wasn't it? He came to bind up the brokenhearted. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Why? Because you speak faith into people's hearts. Their faith arises and you, you bring them to a place where they can receive from God. Then the lame man shall leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. In the wilderness, waters will break out and streams in the desert. Why? Because we started to speak to one another and say, be strong, fear not. And I love this passage in, Mar in Malachi. Look at verse 16, chapter 3. Then they that feared the Lord did what? Spoke often one to another. And the Lord heard. When you go to your brother to encourage him, to your sister to comfort her, the Lord hears. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord. When you go to encourage and to lift up your brother or sister, it's written in God's book. That's pretty special, isn't it? See, God is just saying the degree to which he takes note. He watches your conversation. Those that thought upon his name. God sees it as precious and he rewards it. Father, we thank you for your word to us tonight. and We see from your word that you have commanded us to strengthen the feeble, strengthen the weak to lift up the feeble knees, to speak to one another in encouragement. Father, we see in Your Word that anything that does not edify, anything that does not encourage is corrupt communication. We are to respect one another's personal choices, areas of personal discretion, but yet at the same time speak principles of the Word of God. Speak the testimonies of what you're doing in our life. We're to encourage and lift one another up. And so Father, as we grow together and we become closer and we become more and more comfortable with one another, I ask that we would be careful to put a watch over our lips and to not speak harshly or abrasively to one another. Teach us, Father, to be like Jesus who spoke to the woman. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Teach us that grace. Teach us that forgiveness, Father. 
And let our words be those words that are fitly spoken into the hearts and minds of our brothers and sisters. Father, we love You. Teach us to talk to others like You talk to us. And we give You praise in Jesus' name. Amen.